If you're familiar with the TV show Dexter, you already know where we're heading with today's story. But for those unaware, it's a series about a serial killer who hunts other killers while working as a blood spatter analyst for Miami Metro Police Department. Dexter puts up signature kill rooms designed not to leave any evidence and dumps his victims' dismembered bodies in plastic bags into the sea. One guy named Mark Twitchell took a little bit too much inspiration from his favorite TV show and tried to do what Dexter did, but with one big difference. Mark's victims were innocent. Discretion is advised. This is 10-Minute Murder. Hi, welcome to 10-Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, and I appreciate you joining today for a story that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. It's a weird one. Uh, before we jump into it, take a look at where you're listening right now. Find the place where you subscribe and make sure that you are. If you are, I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Close them. Think of a person that you know. Someone weird, preferably. But not my favorite color is purple weird. They take things too far. Okay. Now, send a link of this podcast to that person. Cool. Uh, also, you can connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media to see the visuals that go along with the episodes, but that's just for the intermediate to advanced level listeners to this podcast. Links are in the show notes. Now, to today's story. On October 10th, 2008, 38-year-old former White Rock, British Columbia oil field equipment manufacturer named Johnny Altinger told his friends that he had planned to meet Jen, a woman he had been chatting with on the online dating website called Plenty of Fish. But after the supposed date, Johnny's friends started receiving strange messages from him. He stated that he was madly in love with this woman, Jen, that he had just met, and she was taking him on a vacation to Costa Rica. Anyone with an IQ above room temperature would find that message super suspicious. His friends knew that he wouldn't just run away with a woman, leaving everything behind. And Johnny's employer received a resignation letter by email, but there was no forwarding address to send a final paycheck. Everyone realized something super sketchy was going on here. And soon enough, Johnny's friends decided that they were not just going to sit around and wait. So they did what any good friends would do. They broke into his apartment. And that's where things got even more suspicious. They found out that Johnny had left his passport behind and he hadn't taken anything with him. No clothes, no personal items, no nothing. Just up and disappeared with just himself. So how on earth was he traveling to Costa Rica, especially without his passport? Concerned about what was going on, Johnny's friends informed the Edmonton Police Service who launched a missing person investigation. And not long after, they found out that before this date with Jen, Johnny had called his friend Dale to talk about how excited he was for the night. During that phone call, Johnny also explained where he was going, exactly where he was going, a garage. He went on a date to a garage. Luckily, Johnny told Dale where this garage was, so he was able to let the police know. And it didn't take them too long to find out that the name on the rental agreement for that specific garage was not Jen, but a guy named Mark Twitchell. Born July 4, 1979 in Edmonton, Canada, Mark Andrew Twitchell was apparently part of a well-adjusted family, a pretty ordinary upbringing. Mark spent a considerable amount of time in his youth in the Midwest and then returned to Canada in 1990. Afterward, he graduated in 1999 from Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, where he studied radio and television. One of his school friends, Drew Kenworthy, described Mark as a good guy but not really a trustworthy kind of a person. For example, in a group project that Mark was supposed to pull his weight and participate, he always had some excuse for not doing his part. Also one time, Mark auctioned off some illustrations at a charity fundraiser that Drew organized after Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace premiered in Canada. All the money from the auction was planned to be given to the Children's Wish Foundation, but the illustrations that Mark claimed were original conceptual drawings made by the production crew of Star Wars Episode One, were actually forged. And when confronted, Mark refused to acknowledge his lie. The whole situation was strange because 
The money would have never gone to Mark himself, so why bring fake items to the auction in the first place and then lie when you've clearly been exposed? After his graduation between 1999 and 2004, Mark lived in the United States and was married to an American woman, but he once again returned to Canada after a divorce. Back home, Mark kept looking for a place in the world and found several different sales jobs. He bounced around a little bit, first at a paper company and later selling alarms and security systems. During this time, he developed the idea of filming a Star Wars fan film. Mark didn't really have the proper training to do what he wanted to do, but he was determined to try it anyway. He brought in professional production crews and basically learned the process as he went. Mark's first film, Star Wars Secrets of the Rebellion, was filmed mainly on green screen sets where he went to college in the summer of 2006. His former instructor, Chris Durham, was actually pretty impressed to how well Mark did producing this movie, how much effort he put into it, which also garnered some attention online and earned him a place on the local news. But no matter the buzz, Star Wars Secrets of the Rebellion never left the post-production stage and has never been released because of what you are about to learn. Mark had already started planning another film called Day Players and was in the process of finding investors for that. Also, he wrote and directed an eight-minute horror movie called House of Cards in a rented garage in the south end of Edmonton. The storyline of the film follows a philandering man who was lured from an internet dating website into a garage where he was then brutally murdered. That sounds familiar, right? It now seems like House of Cards was just a practice run for something that Mark planned to do off-screen. Just a few weeks after he finished filming, he opened an account on the online dating service Plenty of Fish, pretending to be a woman named Sheena. Soon, Mark, as Sheena, connected with a man named Gilles Tetralt and convinced him to pick him up for a date on October 3rd, 2008, from the garage. As Gilles arrived, Mark attacked him with a stun baton, wearing a hockey mask. Fortunately, the first attempt was a failure as Gilles fought back and managed to escape. But because he didn't go to the police to report the incident, Mark was able to try again. And this time, he succeeded. On the evening of October 10th, 2008, Johnny Altinger arrived at the address provided by his date, Jen, and received a text message telling him to come inside the garage where she would be waiting. As soon as Johnny did as he was told and slid himself under the partially open garage door, Mark attacked him with a butcher knife and a heavy pipe. He didn't really have a chance to defend himself. After his victim was dead, Mark cut Johnny's body into pieces inside the garage, which he had set up like a kill room with a heavy metal table the size of a pool table in the center, covered with plastic sheets to catch all of the blood. Just like Dexter Morgan, Mark's hero. But it wasn't quite as easy to get rid of a body as fictional TV shows make it seem. At first, he tried to burn Johnny's remains, but when that failed, Mark dumped them into a sewer. Also unlike Dexter, who was able to avoid getting caught for years, the police tracked Mark down super quick after Johnny's friends reported him missing. On October 31st, 2008, he was arrested in the basement of his parents' home in Edmonton, busy making himself an Iron Man costume and charged him with first-degree murder. Mark, of course, initially told authorities that he had no idea who Jen or Johnny was, but as the police took a closer look at his laptop, they found something disturbing. A document titled SK Confessions had been deleted, but the forensic team was able to recover it. The text, basically a kill diary, which began with the line, This is the story of my progression into becoming a serial killer. And it also stated, this story is based on true events. Followed by the description of the murder of Johnny Altinger. Not really the smartest move to write down a murder that you're going to commit on your laptop. Understandably, because of all the bizarre and gruesome details, Mark's trial attracted a wide range of attention from both Canada and international media. During the hearings, Mark did confess to killing Johnny Altinger, but also claimed that he had done so in self-defense. Mark said that he had planned to prank Johnny to get material for an internet story and told him as soon as he arrived in the garage that Jen was not real. Johnny got mad and attacked Mark, who then killed him accidentally. And I don't have to tell you that nobody believed that mess. And so Mark Twitchell was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison on April 12, 2011. 
He is serving a sentence at Saskatchewan Federal Penitentiary. Another document found on Mark's laptop that didn't make its way into the evidence file for the jury to read during his trial, but has since been made public anyway, the document titled A Profile of a Psychopath is believed to have been written by Mark himself to analyze his own personality and behavior. He wrote, quote, As a producer, I can profit from the sale and distribution of my work, but as a serial killer, I would get nothing more than a quick rush of adrenaline and a prison sentence to follow. No lies detected there, Mark. That's 10-Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. Thanks for checking out the podcast if today was your first time. And a guy messaged me and said that he was a 10-Minute Murder virgin until the Ed Kemper episodes that were aired recently. And that gave me the ick, so, so I blocked him. JK, I didn't really block him. But I did question his choice of phrasing, and I thanked him for listening very politely. Uh, so let that be a warning. I will check you, but I'll do it politely. As we wrap the episode here, make sure you are subscribed and, of course, connected on social media. Links are in the show notes of this episode. And let your true crime friends and family know about this podcast. Thanks for listening to 10 Minute Murder. Be safe and have a good night.